Okay, well, as we uh, get closer to uh, the end of all our lectures, our second to last talk is on uh, highway safety and vehicle extrication. Now, certainly you will be responding to motor vehicle collisions on highways and well-traveled roads, and it's important that, uh, you know, you consider the uh, traffic uh, as a potential hazard uh, while you're trying to uh, care for patients. Uh, law enforcement has the responsibility of uh, either redirecting traffic, uh, closing down the road uh, to assure that uh, you don't have speeding vehicles uh, flying by you while you're trying to uh, care for uh, injured patients. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about vehicle extrication, but not uh, in great detail because that's a specialized skill that pretty much fire services have uh, taken over. Um, there are some ambulance services that do carry extrication tools, but as a general rule, uh, most of that is done by the uh, firefighters. Now, the uh, highway emergency operations, uh, again, remember oncoming traffic at highway incidences is one of the greatest hazards that you're going to face today. You've all seen the videos uh, of uh, vehicles running right into cars that are pulled off to the side of the road. Uh, there are multiple reports of uh, uh, injuries and fatalities of EMS providers that have been struck by vehicles uh, on the uh, highways. And uh, responding agencies and personnel need to be cognizant of their responsibilities in, the, in these types of uh, uh, hazardous environments. Uh, you know, properly setting up cones, uh, you know, maybe turning down some of your lights. Um, you know, it's believed that uh, certainly some of those bright, flashing, rhythmic lights uh, may put some patients uh, in a trance, uh, and they end up driving right into them. Um, EMS response should be limited to only the manpower and vehicles needed to accomplish the mission, and this can really be a challenge, particularly in volunteer organizations, uh, especially in those situations where EMS providers respond from their home in their own personal vehicles to the scene. Uh, there are times where uh, when responding in your own personal vehicle, you, you need to make sure that you park far enough away uh, so you leave plenty of room if the ambulance hasn't arrived yet. So the first arriving ambulance should institute a blocking to protect the work area, and this is preferably a fire apparatus because uh, the ambulance is going to be leaving. Uh, if it is necessary to block lanes of traffic, uh, clear them quickly as possible so that the flow of traffic can return to normal. What we're seeing done around here is law enforcement blocks the mile. Uh, they they redirect traffic around uh, you know around the uh, section of land and don't allow any traffic in that mile where the collision is. Um, a vehicle collision where extrication of the patient is required is uh, one of the most common types of rescues uh, across the United States. Uh, you know, many of these uh, patients are either entrapped, entangled, uh, or are so severely injured that uh, they cannot get out of the vehicle themselves. Uh, your initial response, again, only the primary or first due unit should proceed directly to the scene. Once on scene, park in a single file in the same direction to minimize on scene congestion. Establish command and confirm the exact number of, uh, of, of uh, the exact location of the incident with the dispatch center. And then uh, use apparatus, particularly fire trucks, to institute upstream blocking to protect the work area. Again, law enforcement uh, present on both ends, directing traffic, that sort of thing. Uh, rescue trucks arriving to perform extrication should be positioned downstream of the initial blocking vehicle. Uh, create one and a half to two lanes of blockage so you have plenty of room to work. Position the apparatus at an angle in front with the front wheels rotated away from the incident so that if the blocking vehicle is struck or run into, uh, it won't head in the same direction as uh, where, where you're working. Uh, position the upper apparatus, leave space immediately next to the crash for vehicle extrication units, position the ambulances, command vehicles, and other units downstream from the crash. Um, it allows for safer patient loading and rapid departure from the scene. Responders should always exit into the safe zone if possible after checking to be sure traffic is stopped and be alert for oncoming traffic. Um, you know, uh, law enforcement does do a good job of 
you know, trying to slow patients down or slow um, traffic down. But then, you know, uh, once they're by the law enforcement officer, they have no control over that. Um, and if there isn't law enforcement on scene, then you're at the mercy of, uh, you know, certainly the responsible driver seeing that there's uh, an accident or something going on and then driving with, uh, you know, slow and, and careful not to uh, hit anybody. Uh, place flares or traffic cones to slow the oncoming traffic and, and channel away from the incident lane. Uh, during the night, shut off the vehicle's headlights and white response lights because they can uh, blind oncoming um, traffic. Shut off the vehicle's headlights and uh, white response lights. Uh, best combination of lights to provide maximum visibility. Uh, leave your uh, red and amber warning lights on, your headlights off, fog lights off, and uh, uh, traffic directional boards operating if you have those, if you have the ability to have a yellow light that uh, you know points the traffic to the left or to the right, uh, that certainly would be helpful as well. Um, you know, you need to ask yourself when you get out of the truck at a highway scene, is it safe? Uh, you know, which units are necessary there uh, closest to the scene and how should they be positioned? Uh, as far as vehicle extrication goes, there are different phases in the extrication of a patient. Uh, the first phase is preparing for the rescue and then sizing up the situation and then recognizing and managing different hazards like leaking fuel, airbags that have not deployed, those sort of things, stabilizing the vehicle prior to entering it and then gaining access to the patient. Uh, once you gain access to the patient, then you have to be able to provide uh, primary patient assessment looking for immediate life threats. Uh, and provide a rapid trauma assessment, just a quick head to toe to understand what their most uh, obvious severe injuries are. Uh, you may have to disentangle the patient uh, if they are entrapped or if their legs are wrapped around the uh, brake pedal, you know, uh, if the dash is or steering wheel is pinned down on their body, you know, those sort of things. Uh, you need to immobilize uh, and extricate the patient from the vehicle. Uh, and then provide assessment and care and transport on the way to the hospital and then uh, terminate the rescue as well. Um, when preparing for the rescue, it's a combination of training, practice, and the right protective gear and tools. And the availability of the training that you have will be, depend upon the types of rescue that you're most likely to do in your area. Uh, where I live, we have uh, specialized rescue units. We have a dive team. Uh, we have uh, a specialized extrication unit. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we have different types of uh, rescue specialties uh, depending on the type of, of uh, calls that you respond to. Uh, we also are seeing uh, high angle rescue uh, specialties uh, coming up uh, in dealing with uh, people who uh, are on or in the wind turbines uh, when they get uh, sick or injured. Um, you want to conduct a good size up to elevate the hazards and address the need for additional resources. You know, how many patients are involved in this uh, motor vehicle collision? Uh, which one am I going to treat first? Uh, you know, the mechanisms of injury should give you a high degree of suspicion that they may have a injury, but you need to assess your patient to determine that. In other words, when you arrive on scene and you see that the windshield is starred, you know that their head did that and that they have a potential for a head injury, they have a potential for a neck injury, you know, those sort of things. But you need to assess the patient to see if that is true. Uh, do you need additional ambulances? Do you need additional uh, power company, additional rescue squads, fire department with a charge line? Um, and then what is the extent of the patient's entrapment? Is it something that, you know, possibly just prying the door open would uh, get them out? Uh, or are they going to need to have the roof removed, the doors cut, those sort of things to get access to them? Um, so what does the scene size up tell you about the need for extrication? I mean, obviously, if patients are still in the vehicle and they can't get out, then they may need to be extricated. Uh, as an EMS responder, we typically don't wear turnout gear. Uh, but if we're going to uh, be working in the inner circle, 
uh, inside the vehicle, maybe providing care while the extrication is occurring, then we need to have full protective gear as well. Uh, if your service does not provide you protective gear, then get your own um, and make sure to use it. Uh, if you're injured as a result of, uh, you know, strips of uh, ripped metal or uh, sharp plastic or broken pieces of glass uh, while you're crawling around inside a vehicle, then, um, you know, that would uh, potentially be your own uh, responsibility or fault. Um, you need to wear a helmet. Uh, all responders providing to uh, motor vehicle collisions on major travel roads have to wear safety vests that are highly visible and meet the ANSI safety vest uh, guidelines. Um, during the extrication operations, it, there's always an increased risk of exposure to fire, uh, ga glass, fluids, uh, battery acid, uh, antifreeze, uh, brake fluid, tranny fluid, uh, and then sharp objects. So it's best practice for you to wear uh, turnout clothing, including helmet and eye protection, if you're going to be in the vehicle with the patient or in the inner circle. Uh, matching the level others are wearing, um, you know, you can look at what other workers in the industry are doing. And uh, I know that typically EMS providers don't have the same level of protection or as thorough a protection uh, as a firefighter or somebody trained in rescue because they'll have their turnout gear, they'll have their uh, heavy gloves or helmet, that sort of stuff. Uh, it's lucky if uh, most EMS providers have access to uh, perhaps a, a coat and um, a leather gloves and a hard hat. Eye protection as well. Um, so you need to have these uh, pieces of personal protective equipment uh, when responding to uh, motor vehicle collisions. Um, you know, complex access to a scene involves the use of a lot of tools and equipment to reach and extricate patients. And again, these typically are going to be uh, firefighters who have been properly trained on uh, the use of this specialized equipment in order to gain access to the patient. You want to protect your patient. Um, so if you've ever been inside a vehicle when extrication occurs, particularly if they're using their hearse tools, it's extremely loud and it can be very frightening. So, you know, having something to uh, put over the patient uh, to protect them well, while this is occurring uh, is uh, certainly helpful. And that might be an aluminized rescue blanket. It might be a lightweight vinyl coated uh, paper tar tarpaulin. It may be a wool blanket. Wool blankets certainly are, are work very well. Um, and then a, a short and a long spine board uh, to shield the patient uh, as well. Uh, you know, there's nothing to say that if you, you can't put hard hat, safety goggles, uh, ear protection, dust mask, those sort of things uh, on your patient and yourself uh, during the extrication process. Um, use the ambulance and its warning lights uh, as a first form of traffic control if uh, rescue and law enforcement isn't present. Uh, position other warning vehicles as soon as they become available. You can use flares for traffic control. Uh, I don't know many people that use them because of the whole issue of the potential for spilled fuel. Um, you know, unless you put the flares uh, quite a ways back away from the uh, scene. Uh, remember that they can cause uh, fires from dry vegetation and other combustibles as, as well. Um, don't throw your flares out of a moving vehicle. Uh, airbags are designed to inflate on impact and dissipate the kinetic energy, which minimizes the trauma to the body. Uh, the airbag will create a smoke in the vehicle, which is typically cornstarch or talcum powder, and sometimes sodium hydroxide. Um, but if an airbag has not deployed, uh, you want to be very careful, particularly in a, a motor vehicle collision with a frontal impact. Now they do have many vehicles that have side airbag curtains, those sort of things. So uh, the patient is completely surrounded by airbags. So depending upon the uh, impact, they may have some protection. Uh, regardless. But if an airbag is not deployed, you don't want to put yourself between the airbag and the patient because it may deploy. If the bumpers were involved in a collision, you may notice that the bumper's shock absorber system is compressed or loaded. So never stand in front of a loaded bumper. 
uh, stay in diagonal or perpendicular instead. Uh, chain the st shock absorber to prevent an uncontrolled release. Uh, spectators may interfere with your rescue and emergency care efforts and also block traffic. So if policies permit, ask responsible looking bystanders to keep the spectators away. Give them barricade tape, uh, but do not put uh, these people in unsafe positions. Uh, you may be held liable if uh, an adverse event occurs when you incorporate a spectator into your rescue. Uh, high voltage lines could be an electrical hazard. Assume the entire area around the high voltage line is dangerous. Uh, conductors may have touched and uh, energized the vehicle. Uh, your ordinary pr pr protective, your ordinary clothing gives no protection against electrocution. So, although it may be very hard to, you know, watch a patient in a vehicle who's uh, severely injured uh, and you can't get anywhere near him because of down power lines laying across the hood, uh, you need to make sure that that is de-energized before you uh, gain access to the patient. Broken utility poles are very dangerous as well. You need to set up a large safety zone and discourage occupants uh, of the collision from leaving their their wreckage until you can make sure that the ground around them isn't energized. Uh, determine the number of the nearest pole you can safely approach and ask your dispatcher to advise the power company of the pole number and its location. Um, do not attempt to move down wire lines. Uh, do uh, Stand in a safe place until the power company disconnects the power or cuts the wire. Um, you know, when you have a broken utility pole and the wires are still attached, the pole maybe has snapped off just above the ground, uh, but the wires are supporting the pole, you want to park the ambulance outside the danger zone and notify your dispatcher of the situation. Stay outside the danger zone until the power company, again, can de-energize the conductors and stabilize the pole. Uh, keep spectators and other emergency vehicle personnel out of the danger zone. Um, Damage pad mounted transformers, uh, again, uh, uh, transform large amounts of electricity. So you want to request an immediate power company response. Uh, don't touch either the transformer case or a vehicle touching it. Uh, warn other emergency personnel as well. Stand in a safe place until the power company de-energizes it. And then keep spectators out of that area as well. Now, vehicle fires. Um, for small fires, a 15 or a 20 pound class ABC dry chemical fire extinguisher uh, will extinguish almost anything that's burning. But if you've got fire in the engine compartment, don't attempt to extinguish it unless you can get the hood fully opened. So here's extinguishing a fire with the engine compartment with the hood fully open. Uh, fire in the passenger compartment of the trunk. Uh, you can apply extinguisher sparingly until the occupants are freed. If in the trunk, apply sun, the same principles as the engine compartment. Open the trunk lid and extinguish the fire. Uh, fire under the vehicle. You can sweep from under the passenger compartment uh, with your fire extinguisher. Um, truck fires. Uh, the ABC fire extinguisher um, will work for most things but remember burning truck tires are especially dangerous never stand directly in front of one it could blow the flames can spread to the cargo uh, or the tires and tires can explode um, disabling the vehicle's electrical system remember that many cars have electrically powered doors locks window operators seat adjustment mechanisms and when you dis disconnect the uh, electrical part of the uh, vehicle then none of those functions work um, you do want to, uh, once you gain access to the patient, get the seat out of the way, you know, those sort of things, disconnect the negative cable from the battery, which will kill the power to uh, everything in the vehicle. Now, with that said, we all know that airbags and other things hold power for up to 5 or 15 minutes after the cable's been disconnected. So even though the the power has been shut off to parts of the vehicle, uh, they may hold a charge for a bit of time. Stabilizing the vehicle, if the vehicle is on its wheels, turn off the engine, step chalk three sides of the uh, tires. Uh, in addition to turning off the engine, pull the keys out of the ignition. So here they are stabilizing a car on its wheels with cribbing while the patient uh, contact is initiated. 
Uh, if the vehicle is on its side, stabilize with ropes, cribbing, or stabilizing bars. If the vehicle is on its roof, utilize uh, four by four wood blocks to build a crib box uh, and uh, maybe even airbags uh, to lift the vehicle up um, and slide the blocks into place. So here's a vehicle on its side, stabilizing the struts with maximum stability um, so that the vehicle doesn't roll back over. Um, gaining access, uh, simple access, check the door and the window to see if it's open. Try before you pry. Um, uh, maybe the door is locked, but if the patient can hear and understand you, maybe they can lock the door from inside. Complex access are going to require to utilize tools and equipment. You, know, you may have to break glass in the side or rear window in order to gain access to the patient, and you can do so with a window punch. Um, make sure the vehicle interior is accessible. Uh, oh, why we would um, cut the roof off. Um, and the doors as part of a um, disentanglement. Uh, so uh, step one uh, and two, you gain access by cutting the doors off, cutting the roof off. This is going to uh, expose the vehicle interior. It's going to create a large exit point for the patient. It's going to provide fresh air. Uh, it's going to give you quick access to a critical patient, which may improve their uh, survivability. Um, step three is disentangle the occupants by, by displacing the front end. Uh, you can easily accomplish this um, with uh, heavy-duty jacks and hacksaws. Do not cut the steering column or airbag wiring. It may cause unexpected firing of the airbag. All right. Um, you know, we briefly touched on airbags here as well. Uh, we, we didn't touch at all on... Uh, hybrid cars, we didn't touch at all on uh, completely um, electric cars, cars driving on hydrogen. Uh, so, you know, your best resource for those sort of, uh, that sort of information is uh, with your local uh, car dealer, uh, talking to one of the technicians or having the technician come and uh, talk to the class uh, about uh, the different types of airbags, their location, their deployment, uh, what to do with an all-electric car, uh, you know, those sort of things. All right, so if you have any questions, you know how to get hold of me, and I will, uh, I'll talk to you soon.